Where I'm From, the podcast that proves no matter how far you go, you'll always keep a little piece of home with you. I'm Bill Meeks. This week, actor and puppeteer Paul Zaloom joins us to talk about where he's from, the village of Garden City in Nassau County on Long Island, New York. He's Beekman, and we've just broken into Paul Zaloom's world. You might know Paul Zaloom better as Beekman, the other scientific sketch comedian who hosted a 90s Saturday morning educational show called Beekman's oh, World. Stay in there. Get ready for Amazement City. Ray? Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha! Bada bing! Bada bang! Bada ball! Paul's an accomplished performer with a background in everything from theater to puppetry to sketch comedy. But years before he traded quips with Lester the Rat, he kicked around the village of Garden City. Garden City, New York, was founded in 1869 by merchant millionaire Alexander Turney Stewart to create a place that, quote, embodied his ideals, wisdom, and wealth, which is probably why Paul describes it as 100% white and square and boring as hell. Let's talk to Paul about his community, the surrounding cities where he went to school and got more hip, and maybe one or two science questions just for fun. And folks, I am pleased to welcome today to where I'm from, Beekman himself, uh, Mr. Paul Zaloom. How you doing, Paul? All right. Thanks for having me. Nice to be here. I am so excited uh, to have you. I was telling you before we went live, I loved Beekman's world as a kid. It was just like Pee Wee Herman meets Mr. Wizard almost, just like this really like goofy sort of like broad sketch comedy approach to science, which I, I grew up in a homeschooling household that pulled us out of school because they didn't like science that much. So it was really like my one way in <laughs> to science. Uh, so thank you for that. Yeah, you're welcome. That's great. I, I love hearing the stories. <laughs> Most people, I think, know you as Beekman. Do you think there were any local influences where you're from that kind of informed the Beekman character? Well, the local TV, you know, Soupy Sales, that was a local show. I think it got syndicated later on, but it was a kid show, the Soupy Sales show. And that was on in the 50s and 60s. And that was a pretty big influence on Beekman. I thought, you know, it was kind of the way to go is to follow the soupy model. And mm -hmm. I, I I guess they may have shot in Chicago at some point, but then they were in New York and he had started somewhere in the Midwest. So I'm, I, I know he was shooting out of New York at some point in his career, but we, we were very influenced by his, the way he treated the frame of the TV, like it was a stage, like that it had yeah. edges. You know, it's like an old mm -hmm. Augville way of looking at it. Proscenium. Yeah. yeah, and where so that meant that there were wings and mm -hmm. he would look into them and, you know, he played to the crew. So he's always, his eye line was to the crew. I mean, that had ne never been done in television before or since. Um, yeah. Except I, I think the Uncle Floyd show did that, which was influenced by Soupy. Uncle Floyd was a New York local and I think syndicated TV show uh, that was kind of a spoof on a Soupy style kid show. And he played to the the crew. So the eye line would be where your eye line would never be, you know, talking to, you know, people off mic and they're <laughs> laughing and, you know, there's like a, a dozen of them. That's it. Mm -hmm. And then the, the white fang and Bluetooth were hands that came in, the arms that came in and in, in fursuits. Yeah. And you never saw, and Supi would look up at them. You never saw them. All you saw was the arm. And I think it's really mm -hmm. great for kids that it's not all spelled out. You had to use, use your imagination like what is that thing and if they would come and go uh, 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 uh. <laughs> and then soupy would translate whatever um he said and you know the guy would bring the the arm would bring in a pie or whatever uh -huh. so we had that thing of a hand coming in from the side it was a character called ray ray i need a light <laughs> no 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 a mud light oh Thank you. <clears throat> it was a way to have things brought onto the set. Like if we needed a cup or, and some glue or whatever, Ray could bring that in. And he was an IOTSI guy. He was a prop guy. But he also had a union card because he was a comedian, I guess the SAG card. And so every time 
the director, Jay Dubin, would say, okay, uh, have Ray bring it in. The crew would all go cha-ching. <laughs> <laughs> he was getting like the daily rate. Uh, those royalties for a hand are, are very high, very high, especially back in the 50s. I, I was doing some research on you, and I saw that you grew up in a big family just like me. I think we had like eight kids and a few steps and halves and stuff. Uh, how did, uh, you know, growing up in a big family, your environment sort of uh, push you into comedy and performance, or did it? Well, there were two generations of us. There were three mm -hmm. of us who were born in the 50s and three that were born in the 60s, and we were separated by about 10 years. Mm. So it was really, we didn't really all six of us grow up at the same time. It was 10 years. That's, that's a big, a big distance. It wasn't like a big brood of you. It was kind of like, you know, a couple would filter out as the others were coming up kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We were like that too, where it was like, my parents had uh, three kids and then they waited like eight years and then they had four more kids. So they were like the older set in the, in the younger set. And they definitely a bit of a generational <laughs> divide in the house at points. Huh, yeah. But my parents got free babysitting. So. Right. Right. I grew up in a house on Cathedral Avenue and the house was, it was an old Tudor house with like really pretty green ceramic tiles. I mean, it was a beautiful house in that fake Tudor stucco with the beams you know super corny crap <laughs> but inside very really nicely appointed it had a um black and white marble entryway mm. so black and white marble uh squares and then this staircase to the side that sort of swept in a curve to the next level yeah and my mom put orange uh, carpeting on that which i thought you know that was just the shiznit well, the orange carpet it was so cool and the motif because it was yeah. black and white tile everything in the entryway was all black and white so the, mm. the orange really popped and there were leaded windows in the house and yeah it was pretty cool pretty cool house yeah that's a uh, one thing about those you know northeastern houses is they're just like there's so much more style to them where once you get like more southern and west in the country it gets to be more like McMansions and, you know, just like neighborhoods filled with identical houses where, you know, in New York, Philadelphia, places like that, it's like you walk into a place, you're like, oh, I can, I can feel the ghost in this room. Like, right. you know, stuff happened here and, you know, someone had an idea for this house. Was Garden City a supportive environment for young artists like you? Uh, <laughs> I really didn't have that much to do with the town because I went to school, a private school that was like a 20 minute, 25 minute drive. So I, I, I didn't have a lot of friends in the neighborhood. They mm -hmm. tend to be on the North shore up by where the school was, but there was, there was a lot of places to ride your bike and, you know, run around, uh, golf courses and stuff like that. It was suburbs. I remember one time when I was a kid, I heard this voice and I got mm -hmm. on my bike and I followed it and it was at Adelphi, college then it's university now it was robert kennedy giving a speech and i just followed the sound on my bike and, and there he was giving the <laughs> speech very very distinctive voice to follow too <laughs> in roslyn um at the end of a long road that was also on a golf course <laughs> and which is uh got turned into a housing development subsequently mm -hmm. um and it was in an old the school's in a, like an old manor home like an English estate. So it was pretty fancy and had fancy floors and yeah, it's all Gothic revival and it was pretty corny. Bougie, I guess, as the kids say these days. Yeah. Why did you have the commute and how did it affect you growing up miles away from uh, most of your friends over on the ritzy side of town? My folks didn't have much confidence in the public school system in Garden City. I mean, I'm sure it was pretty good the schools, but I, you know, what do I know? Um, <laughs> and my dad was Catholic. My mom was Anglican. So she was, you know, not particularly enamored with Catholicism. Yeah. She was an English citizen. My, my mom was a war bride. My dad was a GI. My mom was an RAF. They wanted me to go to private school, all of us. And there was, there were no private schools in Garden City at that time. I mean, there was one, but I think that was a, boarding school 
yeah. like a high school, secondary school. So we, mm-hmm. you know, this was the choice. It was called Buckley Country Day School. <laughs> was that a corny waspy? <laughs> <laughs> uh, very much a ruling class kind of um, wasp, you know, upper upper shelf. Mm-hmm. There were some people there who were their parents were middle class or upper middle class. Yeah. But then there were some who they lived in neighborhoods that didn't have sidewalks. Do you have any sort of like retroactive, I don't know, guilt or something for going to kind of like a posh school with various issues swirling around you? I don't know if I have guilt. Um, mm-hmm. You know, just interesting. It was an interesting experience. I went to uh, boarding school, Choate School, which is another very good school, um, sort of fancy and, you know, high on the list of, you know, good secondary private schools in the country. Mm-hmm. But I didn't I didn't really care for it much uh, or their philosophy, uh, which is sort of Episcopalian. And I, I went to Quaker summer camp and I found the Quakers to be much more um, interesting and loving of children and more progressive and just had a much better relationship to the idea of raising kids and teaching kids. Mm-hmm. So I ended up being a, an exchange student for three months at Putney School, which was like the first sort of progressive boarding school. In, and then that led me to go to Goddard College, which was a hippie college in Vermont. This is the second time uh, the word hippie has come up. I, I I feel moved to ask you, like, do you consider yourself a hippie? I, I mean, I know you're you're probably somewhere right in the right range as as far as age is concerned, but do you still kind of consider yourself a hippie and the hippie aesthetic and all that? Yeah, I guess so. I mean, <laughs> I I don't really think about it a lot. I'm not ashamed of it. I'm not, I wouldn't deny it. Um. There's a lot of aspects to me and to my life, the way I do things, the way I live, that are hippie for sure. But um, I, I don't know. Uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I had really long hair when I was a kid, and but mm-hmm. it's, it was super curly. So instead yeah. of it being like, it would just like turn into a pom pom. Like if I tied it back, it was just this big frizz ball. Mm-hmm. You know, I definitely had a uh, white guy afro going on because it was just, you know, it, instead of going down, it broke just bang like that. Just poof out. I don't really have that problem now, but. Yeah, I, we, I, I always tell people when I was a kid, uh, anytime I went to get my hair cut, the, the barber would always go, man, you have such thick hair. And then when I was about 24, 25, they stopped saying that. <laughs> <laughs> they kind of broke my heart. <laughs> right, right. Happens to the best of us. So you mentioned uh, before that um, Roosevelt Field was one of the earliest shopping malls. It opened when you were a kid. Do you remember the local reaction to what would become an American staple? Yeah, sort of vaguely. I mean, I guess we were somewhat kind of excited about it. I mean, Garden City had outposts of the fancy department stores um abraham and strauss lord and taylor i think there was a bird off goodman there um they're all bankrupt and out of the picture now yeah but they were uh, and there was a macy's too which you know thank god hasn't gone out of bankruptcy i i it, my mom worked at macy's in the late 40s mm. um so i you know, I would prefer it not go under a sort of nostalgic thing. Plus, they got the parade, right? So, yeah, I used to have a friend who uh, his parents lived on Central Park West. They had a place upstairs with these really big windows, like two story windows, and the floats would be at eye level. <laughs> and I remember one time Superman was going by and he turned and came like right towards us, right towards <laughs> the window. And my kid, Amanda, she was just a baby then, or a tyke or whatever. And I remember her fingernails digging into my neck in, in terror that Superman was like literally coming right towards our heads. Luckily, it was before the modern trend of making Superman evil and giving him googly eye, weird, evil googly eyes and everything, because that would have been really intimidating. Right. In the message you sent me, you said there was sort of like a marked difference between 
your your actual neighborhood that you grew up in and the neighborhood you went to school in like I, it, so it was more of like a fancier neighborhood that you would like sort of i don't know travel to yeah i mean the interesting neighborhood was that was the one next door in, to garden city which is hempstead mm-hmm. which is uh predominantly black town and uh garden city was 100 percent white mm. so the cool record store was in hempstead i think i wrote you about the guy that his name was swede he was uh-huh. an immigrant from sweden and he had all the jazz albums and what particularly interested me and my brother he had all the blues albums like everything and folk albums like the whole chess catalog and Victoria Spivey and all that blue stuff. She used to go around and distribute the records herself in her limousine. Oh, really? Yeah, she was in Chicago and she would have people like Muddy Waters playing her records, but they had deals with Chess Records, so uh, they couldn't use their real names on her albums because they had con- exclusive contracts. Yeah. So he'd be like uh, Cloudy Stream instead of Muddy Waters. <laughs> But anyway, those kind of records, you know, obscure blues records and folk records. And, you know, Hempstead was the cool go-to place when I was a kid. You mentioned uh, I, I, that town that starts with an H. I just blanked on it. Yeah, Hempstead. Yeah, you said you really enjoy it. You got a love of, like, thrift stores and antiquing and stuff there. What, what do you like about going and, you know, hunting at a thrift store? Back in the day in Hempstead, the, like I said, it was largely a black community. There were thrift shops there where upscale folks would donate their clothes and they would be sold in the thrift shops. So I used to buy suits from like the 30s mm-hmm. with the, you know, the double breasted with the big shoulder pads. And like, you know, you could buy them for like two or three dollars. So I had at least a half a dozen of those. Yeah. And I've been a vintage clothes fan ever since. Mm-hmm. And also like buying used clothes or a thrift shop. Th- this shirt I bought in a thrift shop. I guess it's kind of obvious, but whatever. <laughs> I, I like that strategy, though. I always tell my wife when she wants to go thrifting, I'm like, let's go up to like the thrift stores, like Plato's Closet up in Beverly Hills or something, because rich people are just throwing out the most expensive crap you can imagine, and you can pick it up for a steal. What I like is I like how design reflects the zeitgeist of any particular time period. So There was tremendous optimism in the 50s and 60s uh, after the war. And that was reflected in in the design in, in, um, you know, mid-century modernism, very optimistic, optimistic about technology, solving our problems, Mm -hmm. going to the moon and (laughs) space and all that kind of stuff. That's interesting that uh, how design reflects that or if you look at the weimar period in germany or or, or earlier in vienna the werkstatt just how all that design influenced artists influenced each other what was going on in the art scene and the interwar period in germany i mean those are things i'm like obsessed with it's what creative synergy right like you know fashion influences media influences literature etc 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 just kind of goes on down the line to create a whole you know vibe for the time period right absolutely when you were growing up there were there was there a lot of local theater did you get involved in theater stuff locally or was that more when you went to college and everything yeah only in school Mm -hmm. I was in the school plays. And of course, they were, you know, competitions. <laughs> <laughs> there were two teams in the school, the blue and the red. I, of course, was the blue. My whole family, were we were all blues. And um, they would have an, one play a year. And part of the tally that the two teams were trying to reach, because it was all the sports, all the points, you know, we competed at the end of the year so one of the ways to earn points was having the better play <laughs> <laughs> that was more my speed than the athletic stuff mm-hmm. do you remember what plays you did i uh, it was did you do like classics like our town or i don't remember i mean i oh, remember yeah. in in public school because i went to public school in kindergarten first grade uh we did a show where we were all rabbits mm. each one of us our moms would make the costumes <laughs> so it was a pretty, you know, had a pretty wild aesthetic all over the place. 
I was going to say, I think we share that though, because my first stage production, I was Thumper in Bambi. So we both got our starts playing rabbits. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. And one, one family rabbits had spots and one family didn't. I don't know what that was about, but I played, I played the lead role of the daddy bunny. <laughs> And I do have pictures of me in my costume, you know, looking like super cute. I, played, I remember in high school what plays I was in. Um, mm -hmm. Arsenic and Old Lace, I played a, a cop. Classic. Yeah, uh, just played a minor role, but kind of stole the scene. Me and the guy with me, the, there were two of us. And I said, oh, let's chew gum. We'll make a big deal out of blowing bubbles and shit like that. And so <laughs> that's what we did. And we kind of stole the scene, but it was okay, I guess. That's always so fun when you can find someone, a fellow actor on stage to like, you know, because you're performing the same play over and over and over again. It's nice to be able to change it up. Like I remember when I was in Dial In for Murder, I was the detective and I would write the most obscene things I possibly could on my notebook that I showed to the, another character during the show. And it would be like a challenge to see if I could get him to break, <laughs> you know? Right, right. In, in high school, I was in the zoo story and the, the playwright was an alumnus of the school, so he came to the production. I was like 15 or 16. And, mm -hmm. You know, this is a six-page speech. I played Jerry in the, the zoo story, and Edward Albee's in the audience. And so I did vamp a little bit, and he said he didn't appreciate the variations in the, on the text, which I understand. You know, he wrote the thing. would have been good if I had memorized my lines, but <laughs> it, it was a tough school. It was a, a lot of homework and all kinds of crap, and yeah, I've never been much good at learning lines, but uh, anyway. Mm -hmm. And then we also did the American Dream. I played Mommy. That's another all be, all be play. I played Mommy, and I had my hair and my beard and curlers. I had a beard, I guess, when I was <laughs> 18 or whatever. But we did a super campy version of um, the American Dream, mm -hmm. the all be play. Beekman's World, one of the things that I always remember about it is all the costumes and the wigs and your Roy G. Biv character always sticks out in my mind is like the hippie guy. I guess you got to start uh, sort of putting on different characters physically uh, pretty early on. Yeah, they got the idea from the first show I played Galileo and to have an Italian accent. <laughs> so nice they say my name twice uh, did you know this and betsy potter the costume designer tricked me all out in this sort of renaissance -y, corny italian outfit and i played galileo with like a cartoony italian accent and i remember the writers saying can you do other accents i said yeah i mean i can pretty much do just tell me what you want and i'll do the best i can <laughs> uh which, you know, range from being pretty okay to, like, really not okay. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I got to play a lot of characters, and that was really fun. Yeah, you can definitely tell you, like, kind of cycling through them. Again, I bring up the Roy G. Biv character just because that sticks out of my mind. But it, I feel like you probably played five or ten different characters in every episode of Beekman's World. Definitely not that many. I mean, I, there was Art, the chef, the mm -hmm. cook. And he was just more New York than Beekman was. The always appetizing Art Burn. Oh, hello to you and you. And welcome to my humble command. Beekman already had some little bit of New York going on, but but Art Art was like totally, you know, from the neighborhood and and the director, Jay Newman, you know, he's a New Yorker and he grew up in Brooklyn. He has a total Dems and Does. Brooklyn accent, and then then the dead guys from science. And then there was also Meekman, but that was a one-shot. There was Professor Boring. Was that what it's called? Professor Boring? And I wore like uh, sort of Jerry Lewis goofy teeth, and it was mm -hmm. made, they were made like old film reels. You're it. Fluid and excreted from the body. So let's face it, we're talking pee pee. And it, he mainly did definitions, but he had like super buck teeth. Something I didn't really 
realize until I started doing the research and stuff is not only, you know, are you sort of character actor, a character comedian, but you're also, uh, you do a lot of puppetry and stuff. Uh, what kind of led you to pursue puppetry? I really haven't worked as an actor, um, except like a couple of times in mm -hmm. 50 years. Uh, I got involved with the Bread and Puppet Theater because I went to a hippie college in Vermont. Ladies and gentlemen, the next episode in our continuing giant puppet melodrama as the Teatro Mundi turns, or the young and the paper mache. <laughs> as you recall from our last episode, Cliff here had just opened his own service station, while Dawn finally made it onto the Varsity Squad. Hi, I'm Cliff. I fix cars, and I uh, like meatloaf. They were in residence there, and I took a couple of workshops, and they said, hey, you want to join, be in the company? And I said, sure. And so that's, that's what I did, and I still work there, and that was 51 years ago. This game is called Hometown Trivia. I'm going to ask you some questions about your hometown, hometowns, the tri-village area, I guess, and uh, we'll see how you do. First up, uh, what famous former entertainment journalist has an album called Garden City dedicated to his hometown? Famous journalist? I don't know. I'd say entertainment journalist. That's pretty... He's also a musician. That might give you a hint. Oh, uh, John Tesh. John Tesh, that's correct. <laughs> Why do I know that? What was the name of the millionaire who founded Garden City? Oh, Stewart. Stewart, uh, yeah, I'll give it to you. It's Alexander Turney Stewart. Um, I, in my research, I was looking it up, and it kind of sounded that he was like, I'm going to create this city to be for all the super powerful kind of rich people, uh, which I thought was kind of interesting considering what you said about your hometown. Uh, the only reason I know that is, again, I think I'm slightly remembering that, but there was a Stewart Avenue. That was, I guess, the main drag um, in town. So yeah, that was, okay, next question. <laughs> okay, what famous publishing company moved its operations to Garden City in 1910? Uh, Doubleday and Company. Double day. You are very correct. How many golf courses are there I in Garden City? I don't know. I'm going to say either eight or 18. Eight or 18. Wikipedia told me three, but there, that really? might be like a course with like a couple of different lawns or something on it. No, it's it, I, eight, 18. That makes no sense. <laughs> three, three makes sense. And uh, last but not least, what professional wrestler also hails from Garden City? <laughs> Um, Donald Trump. No, uh, no. Well, I hope not. <laughs> professional wrestling, you know, I don't know. It is. I, I'm not a huge uh, wrestling fan myself, Paul. Uh, his name is Mick Foley. I, I know the name. I know it to, to hear it, but I'm, I wouldn't know it to see him in a ring necessarily. Huh. Where I'm From is brought to you by Stream Studio. That's S-T-R-E-A-N-N -N Studio. The web app that puts you in charge of the live show. Stream Studio allows you to take your streaming game to the next level by allowing you to stream to multiple platforms at once. If you want to go to Twitch, if you want to go to YouTube, if you want to go to a website that isn't supported even, you can stream to all of those platforms at once, get feedback from your audience, and most importantly, it puts you in control of the show. Now, Stream Studio has several packages that work for just about any type of broadcaster. From the free plan, where you can stream with a watermark, all the way up to the gold plan, where you can have up to eight guests, you can stream to as many social platforms as you want, you can get a web link to share your show with external audiences, and you can even get an iframe so you can embed your live stream show directly into your website. Hey, I love Stream Studio so much, I'm using it to produce this show. I want to thank Screen Studio for supporting where I'm from. And you can give this fantastic software a spin and support where I'm from at the same time. Just head over to our website at billmeeks.com slash where I'm from 
and click on the Stream Studio banner so they know we sent you their way. And we want to thank Stream Studio for sponsoring uh, where I'm from. Okay, we're back with Paul Zaloom, uh, TV's Beekman. What do you remember? In a, it might not even be around anymore, but what are some sort of can't miss attractions that you'd recommend to people visiting Garden City, even like historical sites? That's, that's a hard question because the one thing that I found interesting there when I was a kid was the Garden City Hotel. Mm -hmm. And this is a huge, really big, old hotel that was kind of right in the middle of the town and i used to like to bike ride up there and then just sort of sneak in and wander around i think there was a barber shop there that i used to go to in the basement <laughs> but i loved old things and mm -hmm. antiques and still do and interested in old stuff and old architecture so the garden city hotel was really cool so, of course, they tore it down. And then we lived on a street called Cathedral Avenue. And there's this cathedral that's set in a, not a field, but it has like a big yard. <laughs> okay, mm -hmm. the cathedral can have a yard. And um, it's like a downsized Gothic cathedral. So it actually looks kind of small. It's not like Rass or, you know, Shop or something. It's like this, you know, sort of little church. But it, it's a cathedral. I don't know what the hell makes a cathedral, but it's Episcopalian, it's not Catholic. Money so, makes a cathedral, I think. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, Episcopalianism, that was the religion of, of the ruling class in those days. Mm -hmm. Now it appears to be Catholicism, but, you know, back then it was, Episcop you know, old, old school wasp. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything that you miss at all about, about the area? Uh, no. <laughs> I mean, you know, the proximity to the city was great. You could get on the Long Island Railroad and be in town pretty quickly because Garden City is close to the border with Queens. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not way deep in the island. I also remember as a kid going out to Montauk, well, once, and it was really cool out there back in the day. And the Jones Beach, which is on the South Shore, not that far from our place, that those beaches are spectacular. I mean, I've never mm -hmm. seen beaches like that, where the the sand will be a mile deep. Oh wow! And you know, like the desert or something. And <laughs> and they were all tricked out during the WPA era with these cool Art Deco beach houses and toll booths and all this stuff. So, yeah, Jones Beach is really incredible. And you've just broken into Beekman's World. Beekman! Paul, I've done my best uh, so far to keep my fanboying to a minimum, but I'd love to hear the origin of Beekman's World and your involvement with it and how it all came to be, if, if you'd be so kind. Well, the origin was uh, the creator, Jock Church, had made a column in the funny pages for kids. And he, he did it on a Mac in the early days of the Mac when, you know, nobody was, was really doing that. And he sent them out free. It was called You Can with Beekman and Jacks. And it was the same sort of conceit as a show where kids would ask Beekman questions about science and then Beekman. Beekman and Jax were sort of equal characters in the comic strip. They would answer the questions. Um, and somebody, and they, so he sent it out free to different papers and it started catching on and they started running it and they were also publishers. So they owned it. They hooked up with a, a TV outfit called Belo. They made a TV show out of the comic, out of this daily or weekly, I don't know what, I guess it was weekly comic um, because it was a children's television act in 1990, which said in order to get your license renewed, you needed to have a certain amount of educational and or informational programming a day, a local mm -hmm. television station. So our show was sort of designed to meet that requirement. Yeah. The shows that have like the EI in the corner when they start up. When uh, you got approached about that, had you ever thought about yourself as like a children's television educator or were you like i don't know man like like uh, this might not be my scene 
I mean, it was a very different turn for me. I came up in an avant-garde, neo-German expressionist, anarchist theater company that was not at all commercial. Um, mm -hmm. That was my background. So it was a huge cultural shift. And I had been doing my own solo puppet shows for, um, I don't know, 15 years or something when I got hired. Yeah. Um, and just making a living by touring the shows and getting commissions and grants here and there. Uh, and just kind of eking a living out of the deal. So it was, it was a big difference for me to go from the, you know, downtown New York, just the <coughs> wild sort of artist generated homemade theater thing to the super hierarchical Hollywood structure, which is really built around money more than anything else. So that was an adjustment. Um, if I remember correctly, you you guys were on CBS, weren't you? Uh, we started out in syndication. Oh, okay. And okay. we had two or three fewer stations than Jeopardy. And Jeopardy was the number one syndicated show in the country. Mm -hmm. So we had incredible coverage, well over 90% of the country. And then CBS went to Columbia Pictures Television they were the producing entity that Universal Bela put the show through or whatever. <laughs> Partners, I, I don't really get it. But anyway, they said, oh, CBS said, we want to buy this out of syndication and make it a network show. Think crazy questions. What an amoeba. Do Eskimos have refrigerators? Think outrageous answers. <laughs> Let's hand jive. Think the wackiest experiments on... Absolutely. <laughs> CBS. Thanks, CBS. Thanks. You want to take it out of syndication. That just doesn't happen. I mean, maybe it does now, but back in the day, that's not how things worked. Yeah. You had shows that were on the networks that then became syndicated. You didn't have shows that were syndicated that became network shows. But they wanted to be able to offer their affiliates an inoculation against FCC problems with having their local licenses renewed. Yeah. So that's why they wanted it. And then the next week, Fox ended up buying like eight of their stations. <laughs> the coverage, I think, was like 78%. So it wasn't a great move for us uh, in terms of coverage. But I guess it's prestigious to be on CBS. I, I don't know. What was it like being a sort of a national children's entertainer? Like, did you start getting recognized when you went out to the grocery store? Or how did it kind of impact your your personal life? Well, I didn't get recognized because I wore this fright wig, you know, with the hair sticking up. And it totally changed my appearance. So I didn't I, No, I got recognized maybe 20, 25 times. The great thing was, no, it wasn't, it, I didn't have like a trademark bow tie or any of that crap. It just didn't look, I didn't look like the guy. So I, I was anonymous and that, you know, that was great. Yeah. The whole fame thing and being recognized, all that, that's just a pain in the ass. I don't know. It, it's that. the Clark, Clark Kent Superman effect. Uh, the, the wig was your, was your glasses, right? Right. Yeah, exactly. Connecting back to talking about Superman earlier, was there ever a Beekman float in the Macy's Day Parade? No, but I was on a float in the Rose Bowl Parade. Nice. That was, um, I was hired to be on a float, and um, I literally was dragged through the street on something made out of flowers and waved at like a million people. <laughs> There's supposedly a million people on the route. I don't know, but it was interesting. Yeah. It was very interesting. I've heard it's kind of wearisome after a while, though, because you're just like you're either doing the same three motions over again or just standing there like waving the whole time and throwing candy. I, I, I've i heard, you know, it can by the end of the parade route, it can be a little rough. Like you're like, where am I? What's going on? Disassociative. Yeah, I mean, I I just found the whole thing so sort of wacky and goofy that being in the Rose Bowl parade and, you know, being televised and. And then, you know, there's a million people on the route. It, the whole thing is just so goofy and so outside my experience in life yeah. that I was, I was enjoying the hell out of it. And, and plus, I, you know, I was like, no, you got to wave, you got to, you know, make eye contact, look alive, all the rest of it. Because, you know, it took, it was a few hours out of my life, 
you know, I just want to play it to the hilt. Otherwise, what's the point? It was a very goofy experience. It was fun. Now, uh, back when Beekman was being produced, you said you didn't get a lot of people rolling up to you. You know, now that uh, all the kids who are watching you, like me, are all grown up, uh, have, have you uh, found that you get approached more about Beekman? Uh, no, no, not really. I'll get comments and stuff on Instagram or Facebook or whatever. Uh, but, uh, when Latin America is a different story because the show's very popular down there, uh, in a mm -hmm. way that's different than here. All right. You have broken into Beekman Live. <laughs> All right. Now it's, it's a pop cultural phenomenon in, in Mexico and Brazil and other countries in Latin America that. It's difficult to describe, but it's people are fanatically into Beekman in a way. I, I, you know, it's it's crazy. You know, I'll play to audiences of four thousand, six thousand uh, IPN at uh, Polytechnico in Mexico City. They told me the audience was ten thousand people, and I was playing outside, and so wow. and they go crazy. Um, so I do a very low tech, down and dirty live science demo show as Beekman in Mexico and Brazil uh, when I'm invited. And it's a lot of fun. And uh, people just love the character. And so that's interesting and cool. Was it a situation where Beekman's been had a sustained popularity there since it, it started airing here? Or was it something where like it went there like four or five years after it started here and then kind of picked up the following? I actually have no idea. I don't know the answer <laughs> to that. I don't know when it was when they began showing it down there because what happened was w nobody associated with the sh show knew anything about this. And I got invited to the uh, 75th anniversary of the physics department at UNAM, which is the largest university in Latin America. And it was in the Mexico City branch. And this woman from the department hired me to do a show as part of the 75th anniversary. And at first they wanted me in a 600 seat theater and then an 800 seat theater. And then they said, can we do the show outside? And then eventually I ended up doing three shows for, they said about 6,000 people per show. Wow. So they had no idea. I had no idea. I, this was, and I got there in the state, it was this huge stage these cheering, screaming people just wigging out. <laughs> it was, uh, it's like the story of that guy Rodriguez in, in I think that's his name, in, um, in South Africa. They made a film about this guy. He was, he made an album in the 70s and, you know, it didn't really sell or anything, but some people in South Africa like caught on to it and got really into it. And they made a film about the guy. It was like that kind of phenomenon. And it was a huge shock to me. I came home, told all my friends, and they I don't think they believe me. I mean, they still don't believe me. <laughs> I need 20 security people getting in and out of the venues. And you could say, well, why do people react that way? And it's because there was something about the character that really struck a chord with them emotionally. You know, he was very close to the screen. He was making eye contact with the audience. And, you know, he was a pretty friendly, approachable character. So people established a strong emotional connection to him in a way that that did not really occur in the same way in the States. Uh, and it's something about the Latin sensibility. I mean, it's really interesting. I've, I've tried to get to the bottom of why the people are so passionate about the show uh, down there. And I'll ask people down there and they say, well, because you, the show is funny or, you know, you explain science so well, or, you know, or uh, kids TV in Mexico is shitty and <laughs> you know, they had whatever reasons, but that doesn't explain. It doesn't explain like my car being surrounded by people on, pounding on the, <laughs> on the doors, you know, like the, the like the Beatles or something. It, it, that's about emotion. That's a hundred percent about emotion. It's about the emotional impact that character had on them. Mm -hmm. The way the Beatles music has this emotional impact to teenagers, you know, when I was a kid or, or preteens, I mean, we just loved it because it just spoke to us. So I, yeah, I, it's mysterious and wonderful. It's been a great 
gift because it's really fun going down there. I love, I, I've only played in Mexico and Brazil. I haven't played in Uruguay or in Chile, in Colombia, in Argentina, in all these other countries that uh, have big Beekman fan bases, but I just haven't been invited yet. I, I think it's just like, Maybe because I always very much identified with Beekman when I was a kid. And I th I think it was just because he was almost like a, a living cartoon character. And if you strip off just a little bit of the complexity of being a human and play this broad character, it, a lot of time it's like uh, Scott McCloud, who wrote Understanding Comics, says that people will identify more with a simple smiley face than a detailed photorealistic painting. You know, and I, I think that's probably a lot of the, the appeal, at least for me anyway, of Beekman was just that he was just a, he was a living cartoon character that would come right up to the screen and talk to me. So, right. so, you know, I felt like I had a relationship with him. Right. Right. That explains, that does explain it because kids, kids don't make a big differentiation between the person on the screen and the person in the room. Mm-hmm. It's not like they're looking at some celebrity or whatever. They're looking at somebody like their uncle in the room. Yeah. I mean, I used to pick letters out of the bin. We had a bin on the stage that went around and around in the, in the part of the show, and the hand would go in and pull a letter out. Um, mm -hmm. I would just go in and pull letters out, and if they had return addresses, I'd, you know, I'd call information, get the kid's phone number, and call them up from the set just as a goof. Wow. And I remember calling one kid who lived in Chinatown on Mott Street or Mulberry Street in Manhattan, <laughs> which was near where I lived. I lived near Canal Street in Tribeca. Mm -hmm. And I called the kid and he said, hey, you know, thanks for calling, but like I'm in the middle of something. You know, I go, <laughs> that's the end of the phone conversation. Basically so, got big timed. By yeah, him. <laughs> it was great. I loved that. I thought that was really cool. That pisses me off just a little bit because I never wrote into you because I was like, oh, there's no way they actually read the letters. Like, this is just like, so you can get a sticker or something. I'm never going to write in. Here to find out, you could just walk around the set one day and pick up, you could have picked up Billy Meeks's letter. Right. Missed opportunity. Missed opportunity for me anyway. They did respond to all the letters. Um, mm -hmm. I think they responded with postcards. And, and supposedly we got 1500 a week at, at our high point. I mean... I don't know how much the letters really inspired what we did on the show, because I think the writers had to say, okay, here are all the issues we need to cover or we want to cover. We could figure out a way to cover because the writers were all very interested in science mm -hmm. and then find a letter that matched that. Uh, because the, in the beginning, the letters were fake because we didn't have anybody writing in because the show wasn't on the air. But yeah. after, a short while they they were real um kids writing in and you know we read the real kids letters on the air well we'll go ahead and wrap up the beekman talk i do have one more game for you before i let you out of here paul hometown hot takes now these are simple this or that questions i'm going to give you two things and you have to pick between them and tell me why you picked what you did make sense Sure. Excellent. Okay. First up, Gardens, and I think I know the answer to this one Garden City versus Hempstead. Hempstead. Hempstead, obviously, because, uh, you know, all the artistic stuff there and everything. Okay. Thrift stores versus garage sales. Thrift, thrift stores. Why thrift stores? I, uh, you struggled there. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Garage sales. It, you, it's just they're harder to plan. I, I'm always passing when I'm like, oh, I'm in a hurry. I wish I could stop. But and thrift shops are like, I'm going thrifting. We're going to the thrift shop. So yeah, it's like a, it's like appointment shopping versus a garage show, which is like, oh, let's say, yeah, let's check it out. Yeah, exactly. Nice. Okay, uh, Pee Wee Herman versus Captain Kangaroo. Two other uh, kids entertainers. Well, I would I would say. Pee Wee. I mean, I really enjoyed his show. I thought it was great. Mm -hmm. It was wonderful and hilarious, and all the double entendres and everything. It was fantastic. It looked great. And the guy who did the puppets and does some of the design of that show was the um, uh, scenic designer of our show. And he also did the animations, the computer animations. Wayne White. 
yeah, I always felt like the two shows had a very similar vibe, a weird vibe, which I naturally latched on to. So that's interesting to hear that, yeah, there was some our creative talent uh, behind both of them. Uh, right. Shared between both of them. I did a pilot with um, uh, the Mouse Sounds guy. It's Fred Newman. His name is Fred Newman. Oh, Fred. He was on the new Mickey Mouse Club, wasn't he? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. And a really great guy and super, super talented. And then he also did for the cartoon Doug, he did the bop without bop. that the, like that whole theme song. Too. Right. Very right. talented dude. Very talented dude. The mouth sounds book mm -hmm. was super helpful to learn some of that stuff. And yeah, yeah he's a cool guy. Puppetry versus, you know, physical acting. Oh, puppetry for sure. Puppetry. It's way more interesting for me. What is it that uh, you like about it versus, you know, standing there and playing a character as yourself? I, I just like projecting something through an object, mm -hmm. and manipulating, bringing things to life and getting to play a lot of different characters and playing with scale and, you know, everything being homemade. And I, it just really appeals to me that that's how I myself and how I introduce myself is as a puppeteer. I don't, really feel like much of an actor because what I was doing on Beacon wasn't really acting. It was more like performing. Yeah. You know, it's just sort of two dimensional fake, whatever comedy. It's not like acting or you know, <laughs> methody. Like what's my motivation? You know, it's just not like that. It was playing a character. Does performing with a puppet, does it free you up a little bit? Like from feeling like you're going to get judged by the audience you're performing for? Does it give you like a layer of separation? Well, there is a layer of separation, not so much being judged by an audience, but traditionally not getting arrested by the authorities. Mm. I, I mean, uh, uh, th that's been true for many, many hundreds of years that puppeteers could say things in their performances that actors couldn't say uh, because um, an actor or a you know, a performer uh, would get up and say these things. It's like that person is saying, it, even if they're playing another character. But with the puppets, the authorities just by nature, you know, kind of stupid. And the fact that it's m mitigated through through a third party, so mm -hmm. to speak, makes it not as offensive. So it's not necessarily protecting your personal emotions about performing, it's more protecting you from the ideas you're expressing, you know, by putting a proxy in between. The yeah, yeah. Well, it's a, a, for a long time, people were criticizing the king or the government or whatever would use puppets to express these things because you could be more subtle and it's more distanced and they wouldn't get in as much trouble. Okay, now this is a three for Eliza versus jo Josie versus Phoebe, your three assistants on Beekman's World, which one would you pick in a pinch? I'm not answering that. <laughs> <laughs> no way. I mean, they all brought different things to the table and yeah. different talents, and they were totally different characters. Yeah. And I, I really enjoyed work, was working with all, all three of them. You know, And we had a lot of fun on the set. We just laughed our asses off all day and got mm -hmm. along pretty great. So it was fun. Fair enough. Okay, and last but not least, East Coast versus West Coast, where you are now. I love them both. I mm -hmm. love California, and I love New York and Vermont, and I love Chicago. And there's a lot of great places, what can I tell you? <laughs> Fair enough. And uh, so just for the, the last three, you get triple points, because when someone says, I can't choose, you get a bonus for that. So, so good job. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Hometown hot takes. All right. Well, Paul, I want to thank you so much for joining me today. I'm out here in Los Angeles. Do you do any performance out here? Any live shows or anything that I can come check out? I've been focusing on making short films in the garage um, mm -hmm. since the pandemic. So I'm kind of focused on that. Any of those online? Can people check those out? Yeah, I have a channel on YouTube called Fruit of Zaloom. It's one word, Fruit of Zaloom, all put together. And there, uh, Santa Claus is the main character in the movies. And this, I don't know, six or seven of them up, up there on YouTube. I, I think it's you kind of doing all the performance and stuff, right? Like you play live action characters and you do puppetry and everything. Yeah, I'm using uh, uh, like 300 Santa Claus kitsch figures uh, and using Santa Claus as sort of a, a stand in for 
I don't know, the king of capitalism and consumerism. Mm -hmm. and just where I can get my jollies doing political satire using Santa Claus. Quite fun, quite fun. And everyone, uh, definitely go and check it out. Okay, uh, Paul, I want to thank you so much for joining me today. For everyone out there watching, uh, if you like the show, please consider going to Apple Podcast or wherever you get a podcast and leaving us an honest review to help get the word out about where I'm from. You'll find links to all the places you can find the show at filmmeeks.com slash where I'm from. It's all one word. Uh, you can also watch us record the show live. Uh, you might be doing that now at twitch.tv slash filmmeeks. And I'm also going to be doing a live call-in show in the near future where you can call in and tell me about where you're from. If you want to be involved in that, go ahead and shoot me an email at bill at billmeeks.com. All right. Well, that does it for this week. Uh, join us next time when I talk to somebody else about where they're from. See you soon.